This is Robotic Disclosure, the podcast that reveals everything you want to know about robotic surgery, robotic technology, and how to run a best practice program for your hospital, your surgeons, and your patients. I'm your host, Josh Feldstein. Support for Robotic Disclosure comes from Kava Robotics International, the leader in robotic program consulting, serving hospitals in the U.S. and around the world. Visit kava-robotics.com. This podcast series takes our listeners on a journey into the operating room, the hospital C-suite, the industry boardroom, the surgeon lounge, and more. Our guests are going to tell you about robotic surgery, about current and emerging robotic technologies, and how to run a world-class program for your patients, your surgeons, your hospital, and your community. I'm your host, Josh Feldstein. Our guest today on Robotic Disclosure is Mike Osborne. Mike is the Vice President of Finance for Catholic Health System in Buffalo, New York. And what really makes Mike unique as a finance administrator is his willingness to take a real close look at the clinical dimension of robotic surgery. This is something that sets Mike apart as a finance administrator in our view and allows him to generate some really, really great insights. Welcome, Mike. How are you? When when I ask you a question about the, the program, specifically around keys to success and resources that Catholic has invested to, to make this program work, what are the things that jump to the front of your mind? I guess for for me, you know, it's it's been I guess you know an organized, structured process where you know we're spending time really focusing on you know not just kind of purchasing the technology, but making sure that um, you know that, that that there is access to education um, as well as both physician leadership and administrative leadership. And when you think about the challenges that you guys had to overcome as a a community hospital that has some small number of employed surgeons, but many community-based surgeons in private practice. How have you negotiated bringing surgeons to the equation, Mike? Well, I think what we've, what we've been able to bring people to, I guess, to the table to talk about this in, in a couple of ways. I mean, one is a system we've made a major investment, you know, in our physicians by purchasing, you know, the, the, the robotic technology. And so I think, you know, in return for that, one of the things we realized was that when we're making these, you know, million dollar investments that along, you know, for our physicians, that along, you know, with that investment we're making, that, that you know, we also, you know, require, I don't want to say require, but, you know, we, we're, we also need them to invest in the program as well to make sure that the, you know, that the uh, our robotic program is top tier in quality. Mm-hmm. Now, quality has been a huge undertaking at Catholic Health, and you guys take this very, very seriously when you think about the work that's been done uh, at the committee levels over the past year and a half to two years. Uh, the chief medical officer was involved. The C-suite was involved. What is it that really led to this cultural shift that made a commitment to quality so overarching at Catholic Health? Well, I mean, not just in robotics. I mean, uh, our whole goal, you know, as a system, obviously, is to have a, a top-tier, high-quality healthcare system. And so, you know, robotics is a piece of that. And so a lot of the directional things we've been working on from a quality standpoint, as far as standardization, um, you know, ins- ensuring care pathways, things of that nature, um, you know, those also apply to robotics. And so in robotics, we really just put kind of a specific focus on it. Um, because it was an area that, you know, was somewhat defined and we felt like it was an area where we could use as, where we could really make an impact in. And when you think about making that impact and measuring the effectiveness of quality, uh, data, 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 right? It's a huge, huge issue. And I know you guys have worked so diligently on evolving a really sophisticated, well-audited, uh, well-audited uh, data set. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that uh, your team has not only uh, encountered but really overcome 
and how you have managed to develop a well-managed, uh, audited uh, flow of data. Yeah, well, and, and you know, we still have some issues. So I'll, I'll say that up front. Um, you know, just in maybe, maybe on the uh, on the back end as far as how things may be captured um, by the clinical staff. But what we from the front end, really, what we've done is taken the stance that you know anything we use. We want to be able to track. And so, you know, many times in hospitals, they'll determine that, you know, that once something is used 20 times or 30 times, it, that will load that uh, into the system so that it can be tracked. Our position is that, you know, before any product is used, that we need to have kind of the DNA on that product, on that uh, product so that we know exactly what we're using, how much it costs. And you know, have the FDA approvals on it and, and everything like that. So our item master is, is is very large as far as you know what we're expecting people to document. You know, we view it. I would say you know similar to HR. You know, you don't hire an employee without having their social security number, their address, you know, other pertinent information about it. You know, similarly here. Our position has been, you know, if we're going to use a product, we have to know what that product is and be able to track it so we understand, you know, the costs. We we can track it from a recall standpoint, you know, any other way that we may need to, you know, understand what was used on a particular surgery. Mike, you're a vice president of finance, and you have nevertheless been unafraid, really, in terms of wading in to the clinical world, uh, looking at the specifics of the way robotic surgery is performed, understanding the differences between service lines. How unique do you think that is uh, as an administrator of robotic programs, uh, as as a finance guy, to be able to uh, educate yourself on the job training with regard to the clinical uh, component of this. How important do you think that is to make the program successful? You know, my guess is is it probably is pretty unique. Um, I would say, you know, one of my roles here uh, that, I, that I learned along the way was supply chain. I think that gave me, you know, an interest, at least a, a good background in some of the intersection between financial, clinical, uh, and quality, you know, operation, operational issues. So I think that gave me a good basis to, to at least start the conversation. Um, but I, I do think it's probably pretty unique. But, you know, one of the things, you know, particularly as, you know, reimbursements get lower and technology continues to increase is I think that, you know, everyone has to, you know, have some ability to, you know, kind of move out of traditional finance or just traditional clinical and understanding that, you know, all of these things, um, you know, end up converging together at some point, you know, the clinical side of this, the financial side, the operational, and you, and you can no longer really just focus on, you know, one particular, you know, aspect of, of healthcare delivery. You really have to have some knowledge of all. Mike, when we think about value-based medicine and robotics, how do you reconcile the varying points of view relative to the uh, perception of robotic surgery perhaps being more costly than laparoscopic surgery by some. So other people don't see it that way. Some do, some don't. But how do you reconcile value-based medicine and robotics? Yeah, sure. So I I think, you know, um, robotics is an area really where, you know, where you can put a lot of value-based concepts uh, in, in to, into play. So with robotics, you know, recovery time is going to be quicker. Um, many times reimbursement will be less, you know, because the patient may be an outpatient as opposed to an inpatient. So it's an area where you can, you know, reduce the cost of care from a payer standpoint. So from a payer standpoint, you know, they should be incented, you know, really to, to support robotic surger- surgery. They don't necessarily do that. That. Um, but on the hospital side, you know, to your point, robotic surgery can be more costly. And one of the things that we've really done, you know, because, you know, you also can't be afraid of the technology. Uh, what we've really tried to do is to give, you know, our surgeons and our staff every opportunity to, to hear from, you know, best practice surgeons, um, best practice locations as far as how they, how they um, operationalize using the robot so that we can also bring the cost of care down in our hospitals to, you know, match with that lower reimbursement we're likely to get because, you know, the person, the patients are no longer inpatients or no longer staying in the hospital for three or four days. You know, many times they're out the next day. 
well, you've raised uh, the, the whole concept of best practice now, and I'm going to want to uh, drill down a bit into that. When you think about introducing best practices, whether they're financial, whether they're clinical, operational, it challenges people to do a better job on every level when you bring best practice to the equation. And clearly that's part of the culture at Catholic Health, uh, yet there are real world pushback that you get when you start talking about best practices. Can you speak a little bit to the introduction of best practices at Catholic's uh, robotic program and where you guys have been embraced and where you've had issues that have taken more time to kind of negotiate through the introduction of best practices? Yeah, well, you you mentioned that you know we have a uh, you know I'm, I'm a predominantly a private practice medical staff, and so a lot of the physicians, you know, they you know they may be competing against each other, um, and so you know when you talk about standardization or you know and and they're not all part of the same group or part of employment, you know they may view that as infringing on kind of their their view of the world or the way that they they think is best best practice. But what we've tried to do is bring you know a combination of, you know, expertise um, from outside of the system, as well as bringing together, you know, our our our, our best uh, robotic surgeons internally, and you know, bringing all that together to try to come up with, you know, agreement around here's the best approach, um, you know, or, or an approach that can be used in the majority of majority of uh, specific surgeries, and I, I think that's worked well. And how does that apply, and now I'm going to speak to the, the finance piece of this, supplies, reposables, cost reduction. How does the introduction of best practices serve to reduce variability and really drive down costs in your experience? Yeah, well, what what we've seen is that many times, you know, a surgeon may use additional supplies, additional reposables because, you know, they were trained a certain way. They don't necessarily know, you know, the costs of the different reposables or supplies that they're using. So what we've tried to do is, you know, one, inform them of, you know, what things cost. And then, you know, if there's an ideal way that a particular surgery can be done, what we've done is we have... Um, you know, provided them education on what that is because a lot of times people do something because they've been trained a certain way and showed them, actually spent the time to have, you know, external surgeons show them, you know, here's another approach you can do for this surgery that may result in a lower cost profile. Recognizing that, you know, every body type is different, you know, so you're not going to be able to do that, you know, 100% of the time, but, you know, many times you'll be able to, you know, to use that best practice approach, which likely uh, results in you know lower costs or more efficiency. Again, just because it's a standard a standard way of of uh, of doing the work. One of the challenges that we repeatedly hear in the in the market is when you have a, a an IDN that has many different sites that have different approaches to the management of their robotic program. And I know that uh, at Catholic, that's one of the challenges that you guys have addressed over the past several years, where there's been a lot of variability in, in program management and, and policies, if you will, but from site to site. Can you speak a little bit to how to reduce that variability and create more of a systematized uh, approach to a program? Sure. Well, as it relates to robotics, what we've done is we, you know, we have individual site meetings where we walk through with the individual hospital the results of their particular surgeons. Um, you know, breaking it down by, you know, the type of service, type of procedure. You know, you know, what's the cost, the quality, all of that information around, you know, their particular hospital. And then we take a lot of the issues that may be brought up at each site um, or things we've learned at each site, we bring that to a system meeting where we have um, folks that we that we have nominated to represent from the hospitals, but to, we've nominated them really to sit at a system level where we can talk around standardization and talk about things we want to try to push down into the sites. One of the things we've recently done is really worked on, you know, a brand new credentialing process. 
you know, that um, requires surgeons to do a certain number of robotic cases. If they're not doing that uh, enough cases in order to make ensure they're being uh, efficient and effective, uh, we have a simulator. We purchase two simulators, and they can get additional credit for time on the simulator. They can get additional credit by coming to robotic meetings. But the main goal of what we want to try to do is make sure that people that are using the technology are invested in, you know, being trained on or invested in being robotic surgeons. We really, you know, are trying to discourage someone from doing, you know, one or two robotic cases. We want people that are committed to doing robotics. When you look at data and you see the difference between uh, what are defined as dabbler surgeons and, and surgeons that have higher volume, what, what do you see inside of the, the Catholic Health System's uh, data sets? I mean, the, the number I, we tend to use here is around 25. We want to see people doing at least 25 robotic surgeries in the year. So they're doing, you know, you know, two, two a month, basically, with, as, as a minimum. Um, in our system, um, some of the doctors work at other hospitals. So, you know, we may have to go to the other hospital to get that information to ensure they're doing the 25. But, but that's, you know, where we like our surgeons to be. Um, you know, the, when someone's doing it in one or two is when you just want to make sure that, that uh, you know, that, that they are committed to doing this long term. Mike, you've been sitting in this seat for a long time and you've seen a lot of technology come and go and not just about robotic technology, all different sorts of, of, uh, of uh, surgical uh, technologies. When you think about uh, the future of minimally invasive surgery and you think about uh, computer assisted or robotic technology, what type of innovations would you really like to see happen in healthcare? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I would like to see is are more options. You know, so we're seeing in, in some of the robotic space, you know, spine, orthopedics, that there's a number of options coming to the table. Um, but when we're looking at, you know, specifically some of the general GYN surgeries, there's not a lot of options right there. So I think, you know, by having, introducing some new players into the market, I think that would be helpful from a, from a cost standpoint uh, for hospitals. I would agree. What would you think would be, if you want to share some parting words to, to a, an administrator that was starting a robotic program, Mike, what would you say? Yeah, I, I guess I, I would say, you know, the, the, the robotic, the, you know, the, the robotic equipment is a tool, no different than, you know, a hammer, a nail, you know, anything else. It's a tool that brings additional technology, additional advantages to the surgeons, but you have to know how to use those tools and you have to be committed to, you know, to, to, to making sure that, um, you know, you're, you're educated on how to use them and how to best use them. Great. We've been speaking with Mike Osborne, the Vice President of Finance for Catholic Health System in Buffalo, New York. If you have any questions for Mike Osborne or would like to share comments with us, we'd love to hear from you at roboticdisclosure at gmail.com. You've been listening to Robotic Disclosure. Support for Robotic Disclosure comes from Kava Robotics International, the leader in robotic program consulting serving hospitals in the U.S. and around the world. Visit kava-robotics.com. Robotic Disclosure is produced at North Fire Recording Studios in Amherst, Massachusetts. Theme music by the Verve Jazz Ensemble, verve-jazz.com.